Hello, everybody. This is Brooke Warner, and I am here with Linda Joy Myers. Hi, Linda Joy. Hi, Brooke. Glad to be here with you today. Yeah, we're doing this little teaser. Four ways Marcelo Hernandez Castillo's Children of the Land will help you improve your own memoir. And this is just a short little recording to introduce you to this longer class that we're going to be teaching in November. And before we kick off, I wanted to share with you how Children of the Land came to my awareness in January. The beginning of this year saw a lot of controversy in the publishing industry long before George Floyd and all of the racial reckoning that's happening in our country right now. The publishing industry was getting some serious pushback around this question of own voices and cultural appropriation and reading the works of people who are actually from these countries or cultures, you know, or parts of the world that are writing about their own stories and letting their voices shine. And so someone had recommended Children of the Land and it just blew me away. And I said to you, Linda Joy, we have to teach this one. And and I know you loved it. Oh, I'm still loving it. Again, I'm rereading it several times. And uh, I mean, what I love about it is is that he, uh, the combination of his poetry and his way of looking at the world and sharing the experiences of being who he is, uh, is, is absolutely mesmerizing. I, I find myself, you know, sort of in some kind of dreamland, and yet I'm awake. It's both awake and dreaming uh, with him and just... Um, I really can't really read anything else and give it its fair due right now as I'm as I'm going through the book. And we're going to now talk about uh, the specifics of how he's doing some of that and get uh, give you a window into what this book is about. Yeah, exactly. All for the purposes of helping you improve your own memoir, which is always what these classes that we teach are about. So before we do that, I just wanted to read this little piece because I think it is exemplary of how he writes and how everything that he puts onto the page is uh, is poetic. It has some larger sense to it. So he writes, When I developed black and white photos in my high school art class, I erased all the grayness from their resolution because I believed you didn't need gradients to understand an image. I believed in black and white and nothing else. I wanted someone to look at the images and know what they were looking at despite everything I had done. He talked about distorting them. Everything was either light or it was a tree. You were either in one country or you were in another. There was no in between. Black and white, I had no patience for gray. So it's lovely and it just gives you a sense of his style as Linda Joy and I proceed in here Mm -hmm. to teach you a bit about what we're going to be talking about in the longer class. And we're framing uh, each slide that you're about to see is going to be an entire class (laughs) in November. Mm -hmm. So... uh, Class number one will be memoir as story arc. And so, Linda Joy, what do you have to say about memoir as story arc Mm -hmm. in Children of the Land? Um, Yeah, well, first thing I want to say is that what we have all have to deal with as we write our memoir is what is my story arc? What does that mean? And then, as you see in these beautiful colored threads here, uh, it is how the story progresses, how it develops, and how there's a beginning, middle, an end to it, even in this lovely circular pattern that we're looking at on the slide. And so what he does is he um, he has a straightforward narration that takes us chronologically through time, and he has another layer that he entitles uh, with movements, first movement, second movement, all the way through the book eventually to fifth movement. And these these are like interludes that are thematic, that are poetic, and also dip into other topics, which we're going to talk about in a few minutes. So he goes through the theme of the history of the family, memories, his own and his family's memories. He circles around and around and around, and we learn about the legalization status and what it's like to be an undocumented immigrant and the struggles that his whole family went through. 
Yeah, and what I particularly like about it in the sense that story arc is so intertwined, inseparable from structure. And so when you're thinking about your own story arc, you are thinking about structure and how is something unfolding. And Marcelo, like all good memoirists, is incredibly diligent with his time markers. You always know where you are in time. And so even though he's doing this very interesting sort of linear slash circular journey, because he's he's moving around in time very fluidly but you are never lost you always know exactly where you are in relation to other events that he's already written about that you're tracking and so we're definitely going to talk about the importance of time not losing your reader and making sure to be really really conscientious as you read uh, and guide your journey your your reader through your story Right. And, and these are things that we all struggle with. We may know what happened and, and we know it's the stories in our mind and in our imagination, but we need to ha help the reader understand. And, and he does such a fantastic job. I'm never lost, even if I'm dreaming with him. I love that. Okay, so memoir as metaphor. Wow. I mean, this book is jam packed full of metaphors. I know you were listing a bunch of them off earlier before we started recording. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so a metaphor is a uh, uh, an image or an object or uh, uh, an event that carries multiple layers of meaning. And so he riffs off into exploring the idea of his father's body, how his is like his father and not like his father, how he wants it to be like his father and not like his father. Uh, he talks about gardens and buildings and what they're made of and how they're built and what solidity means even if you're an undocumented immigrant and where can you find solidity. He, he also takes us on a journey uh, to Mexico and we he takes us on this journey up a mountain where his mother grew up. Uh, he we we see bodies as metaphor. I mean it's so interesting how he brings it and then it's threaded all the way through those little circular things that you saw in the previous slide and we come back to them and then they become like old friends. Oh yeah he he showed me this before and now he's here with it. So he has another new thing to say or show about whatever it is, is the metaphor. Right. And he's very conscious of his use of nouns and things and symbols. Mm -hmm. There's a part here on page 132 and 133 uh, for people who have the book. I highly recommend reading the whole passage, but it opens, I was supposed to die in 1990, dragged behind the horse in Mexico. And he goes on to say, my father was supposed to spend the rest of his life thinking about who I would have become and on and on. I should have been a secret. My family told new friends only when they were sure they would be friends forever. I should have died falling off my roof at the age of four. And the metaphor here is falling and, and this idea of, you know, how he weaves in what should have happened all of which would have been a tragedy and would have been terrible. And then he is going on to talk about how he ended up living. And as a result, he was never afraid of falling. He wrote, he writes, I didn't think falling would hurt. And what I want to share here is that too often writers, especially new writers of memoir, don't let themselves just explore topics you know like for instance falling and what does falling mean and what is your own history with falling and what are stories that you have to share in your own life about falling now it doesn't have to be falling right plug in whatever it is for you but this is the poeticism and the thing that allows the reader to drop in and be like, huh, what are my own associations with falling? What does that mean? And so it's not just about what happened. He doesn't do this story. You know what happened and that you're getting. You want that, of course, because he's writing about the experience of being an undocumented immigrant for his whole life in his his country of, of choice, right, in many ways. Uh, but there are so many places where he's exploring identity and belonging and and very specific things like falling and the associations that he has with falling. There are countless examples of this. And it, it just broadens 
the the concepts in the memoir so that it's not just this memoir of like here's what happened it really mm. invites the reader in in a profound way and so we're going to unpack that a lot more for you and we're super excited about all the many ways in which writers can use metaphor to write stronger memoirs right and uh, we love uh, helping people think about that sometimes that's new uh, a new way to think and explore writing uh, with some of the people that we teach in our class. So I get a get running into this and see how we can, in, you know, immerse ourselves into to that idea. Right. So mm -hmm. I, I advanced to memoir as mm -hmm. memory. And uh, and this mm -hmm. one, too, is really seeded throughout the entire book, Linda Joy. Oh, I love it so much. <laughs> um, Yes, the, so, you know, all of us have our own memories. And one of the things that we see people running into, and I ran into this myself, is how much are we allowed, quote unquote, in memoir to write other people's memories? And so we're allowed to do anything as long as it really works. And so what he does is he, he truly makes it work because he lets us know what he's doing. And he, for instance, he goes into his mother's memory. He actually tracks his own memory, his mother, his father. Um, and in doing so, I mean, his book is about himself as an undocumented immigrant. And he is from all these other people. They are undocumented. Uh, undocumented immigrants too. So there's this generational story and a family story that he is telling. And so he, you know, he, he brings us into that full world of memory. Yeah, absolutely. And I loved that so much. And I think these movements that he does too, I mean, it sort of speaks to what I was saying about the transitioning into timing. You know, there's a place on page 182 that I just wanted to share for context or, or for, as an example, rather. Um, it's third movement as migration and a flock of birds. And he writes, I don't know why I went temporarily blind in Tijuana while waiting to cross in 1993. It happened mm -hmm. all at once. And he goes mm -hmm. on to tell this story and he just kind of drops you right into this mem memory. And I, I love the way that he does that because you are able to be dropped in because it's like he's telling you when it happened and that it was kind of weird and it also all interconnects to everything else. And, and there's this way that he does that, that is really powerful and it's not jarring. You know, sometimes people do that and, it ha and it's jarring and it doesn't feel connected. But um, in this case, I, you know, and many other cases mm. in throughout the book, it, it, it's very powerful in terms of um, the pacing. Right. He, he is really good and guiding us as a narrator. And this is something we're always teaching people. How do you, uh, you know, be the guiding narrator that leads the reader from place to place and into different states of mind? And I wanted to give an example of uh, when he's in his mother's memory. And this is on page 71 in the book. And he goes back to the ranch where his mother grew up and his mother had to leave this ranch then and to come to America. She said, he says, I closed my eyes and saw the ranch in its glory days. I could see my mother as a child running through those meadows, laughing and swimming in the arroyo. My mother's small hands led me to the courtyard where she was with all of her sisters. I could see them sitting in the sun, sewing together, making dresses. I wept quietly at the center of my blood. Mm. <laughs> Yeah, so, um, and there's, this is throughout the book, and when you're there, you feel his connection with, like I was talking about earlier, the generations of his family and their stories and what was lost by leaving Mexico, as well as what was gained by being here. It's very paradoxical, and I think for many of us, our stories are paradoxical. Nothing is, it is this way, and it is only that way. It, it, you know, we're writing about the mixed up complex stuff when we're writing memoir. We sure are. <laughs> 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and so that's a good segue to talk about complexity and maybe how to bring that onto the page in a way that might be more relatable or even just lovely, uh, which mm-hmm. is memoir as poetry. And Linda Joy, you and I were talking about all these memoirists who are also poets, uh, yourself included, and who come mm-hmm. from a background of poetry. I mean, Mary Carr, Helen McDonald, and you don't have to be a poet. You don't have to self-define as a poet, but I do think most memoirists love words. And I think mm-hmm. sometimes people don't feel the freedom to be as experimental as they maybe can be to make poems out of their words and, and to integrate them into their scenes. And Marcelo, I mean, I think one of the joys of reading his work is just listening to the poeticism and the cadence uh, throughout Mm -hmm. the story and the ways that he chooses to find poetry in almost everything. Um, Don't you agree? Oh, yes. I mean, there are many phrases uh, and many, oh, many, so many uh, ways where where he ends up creating an image or a picture or a feeling uh, and, and a place, though, that's it, relatable. You know, I think some people struggle with the idea of poetry or poeticism uh, because I think many of us have been in a poetry class where we're like, what are they talking about? <laughs> you know, it was maybe hard to penetrate in some cases. But for instance, uh, I'm just going to read a tiny little phrase here on page nine. Uh, we were in a space between two countries along that indiscriminate line where perhaps even time was irrelevant. You know, things like that, that's just one sentence. But then you can pause for a moment as the reader and think about time and think about when it's relevant, when it's not relevant, when you yourself have been out of the linearity of time and have gone somewhere else. Um, And so not just that topic, but so many others, he. He opens up doors that we can walk in through this imagery and reflection that he offers us. Yeah, it's incredible. And I I just want to give one short little thing for people to look at too, which is page 158 and 159. And again, please read this whole passage, but he's talking about this idea of people going to the other side, which means to the north, right? Crossing the border, which is a very prominent theme throughout the book. And he opens, the butcher went to the other side. His son with the amputated leg also went to the other side. They settled in Georgia and he tells the story. And then he goes on with the rest of this entire passage, the priest went to the other side and he tells the story of the priest. And then he says, the dogs went to the other side. The women waiting on the corner for their bus to the market went to the other side. The market went to the other side. And and it's so beautiful. Um, I I love this passage so much. I mean, these two pages alone could have been published, uh, you know, as a standalone piece. And so, again, so much of what we teach in these classes is about permission. Sometimes I think it can feel intimidating because some of these writers are such profoundly deep writers, and maybe you don't feel that you're going to reach that level of poeticism, but that's not the point. You know, it's it's really just about taking risks in your own writing and and learning to read other memoirists to find inspiration and, and to find, I think, ultimately freedom. Mm. Oh, gosh, I agree with that so much. I, I was thinking as you were talking about my early forays into memoir. In fact, I wrote Uh, my first autobiographical truths in poetry. Um, And then the reason that I went into prose is that I realized that the poems left too many holes in the story and I was kind of falling through the holes and I needed to to weave a tighter together (laughs) and prose forces you to do that. But then in my second memoir, I wanted to loosen up and I wanted to be more associative and allow the dream world that I'd always carried with me to be revealed. And so, you know, 25 years later, I put in, you know, I have some poetic passages um, in in actually both memoirs, but in that one in particular, where I have these interludes a little bit, not like him, but, you know, passages that aren't connected to my actual life. And it was very freeing, and I was able to express things that I couldn't express any other way. Super helpful. Thank you for that closing note. And everyone, 
I just want to tell you all that we're having a lot of good stuff going on. We have this site, www.magicofmemoir.com. It's a very apropos name because we do feel like memoirists make magic. We invite (laughs) you to come make magic in your own writing this fall. Uh, Today, obviously, was about sharing with you a little bit about what's happening with the Children of the Land class. And so you can see that on the right-hand side, four Mondays in November. It's a $99 class. These are each one hour. The six-week boot camp we're also super excited about because look at all of these teachers that we have coming to guest teach Claire Bidwell-Smith, Therese Maylott, Larry Smith, Raina Grande, Sue Williams Silverman, and Jacqueline Woodson, the amazing Jacqueline Woodson, who is doing a whole class on memoir as poetry, which I just am so thrilled about. And so you can take both of these classes for $1.99 or just choose one. We really would love to see you there. We're super excited about these offerings and um, and we'll be writing together, Linda Joy, which I think is also important that the boot camp mm-hmm. includes some writing, especially during this time of the pandemic when everybody is feeling a little out of sorts and looking for community. And we do have a fantastic community. So uh, very lucky mm-hmm. on that point. Yeah, we were writing together with people in the spring and, you know, it was, we were all like, oh, there's something we can do here. We can be immersed in our creativity and our learning together, no matter what's going on in the world. So we do invite you to join us and love to see you there. Yeah, we hope to see you there. Please be in touch. If you have any questions whatsoever, you can also shoot us an email. Uh, We have a special email address at writeyourmemoirin6months, all spelled out, at gmail.com. And otherwise, we're also very easy to find online. (laughs) Both of us are on Facebook and all over the place. So thank you. Hope to see you this fall. And uh, even if you don't take these classes, please read Children of the Land. You'll thank us later. Yes, you'll love it. All right. Goodbye. Goodbye, Brooke. And uh, be safe and be well, everyone. Yeah. Thanks so much. Bye-bye.